Well, hello everyone. Um, on behalf of Access Now, RightsCon, and our co-sponsor of this event, BSR, I want to thank you to, for taking time out of your day to join us to talk about transparency reporting. 10 years ago, Google released a public report, the first of its kind, detailing how they responded to government's requests for user data. Since then, other companies have followed suit. Access Now launched our Transparency Reporting Index in 2014 to compile these reports and highlight trends. And the index has noted over 70 companies worldwide releasing transparency reports. However, some challenges still remain. Though transparency reporting has become more common for tech companies, non-tech companies who increasingly use and hold our data have not caught on to the practice. And within the tech sector, fewer companies have been consistently releasing reports. The larger picture of reporting also presents important questions. Over the last 10 years, has transparency reporting truly been effective in holding government surveillance in check? And how is reporting aided in trust building between companies and their users? The goal of this event is to reflect on these questions and more, to note gaps in need to be filled and to look ahead to the future of transparency reporting. We're grateful to the wide range of speakers who have joined us today to address these topics. Uh, as you can see, we have a very packed agenda for the next 19 minutes, um, and we encourage you to keep the conversation going after the event. Please feel free to share your questions for our speakers in the chats, and we'll try to get to them at the end of the Q&A section. It's now my pleasure to welcome Nicole Karlebach, the Global Head of Business and Human Rights of Verizon, and Michael Samway, President of the BHR Group, to join us today to talk about the early stages of transparency reporting. Thank you, Esedua, and thank you to Access Now and uh, to BSR for co-sponsoring this important and timely event. Uh, Nicole and I have uh, worked together uh, for nearly a decade, and we have had long winding discussions about technology and human rights, and we have also had um, brief and urgent discussions on matters of freedom of expression and privacy across the world. So we'll try to condense those two types of discussions into a fireside chat in just a few minutes. Um, and we hope it sets the stage for a deeper discussion over the, uh, over the next 90 minutes. So thank you again to Access and BSR. So let's begin, Nicole. I think it would be helpful if you give us more background um, on yourself and your role uh, you're the head of global business and human rights at a major technology and media company. Um, and then if you can set the stage and give us context on how your role uh, interacts with the concept of transparency and why it's important to the company. Yeah, so thank you to Access and also to BSR for having us. And um, thanks, Michael. I'm looking forward to a conversation with you today on these topics. Um, as you said, I head up the Business and Human Rights Program at Verizon. We're a dedicated team providing centralized leadership and guidance on the ways our core business, products, services, operations, strategy intersect with human rights issues, including issues like privacy, free expression, the right to be free um, from discrimination. And our efforts, in our efforts, we're building on a foundation for this work that began at Yahoo over a decade ago, which I know you know a little bit about. <laughs> so while the core of our approach to um, managing, addressing, considering um, the human rights impacts of our business hasn't changed all that much in these last few years, um, the issues that we're managing, I think it's fair to say, have considerably um, evolved and arguably become more challenging and more complex. And uh, I think the year 2020, of course, has been like no other in terms of highlighting societal challenges and also the role of technology uh, in our daily lives um, has been perhaps never so evident and never so important as it is now. So as a result of all of this, the responsible development and deployment of technology um, that takes account of human rights considerations, I think has become increasingly paramount. And so the conversation that we're having today about transparency reporting um, in this space, I think is very timely um, as well in, in light of the fact that we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, the 
UN GPs. And, you know, despite that there's been, I think, significant growth in the business and human rights field broadly over the past decade, and that connections in particular between tech and human rights have become better understood, um, there's still room to go in mainstreaming these topics across business within organizations and more broadly. Um, and part of that is sharing information, communication, and being transparent. So transparency reporting being a critical part of that, it's sort of a unique time to be discussing these issues in that wider context. And of course, Michael, you've worked with companies, with civil society, with governments um, in the field of tech and human rights, you know, over this last decade and, and even beyond that. So maybe you could share a bit about your background, some of your work and, and give us your sense about the origins of transparency reporting and, you know, how it's evolved over time. Thank, thank you, Nicole. Um, and you've really covered uh, kind of the present and the importance and timeliness of this topic now. And I'll try to um, rewind the clock about 20 years to the early 2000s. Um, and I guess I should begin by saying that I um, currently do public policy advisory work for tech companies and for civil society organizations on uh, tech and human rights. Um, I teach as an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown School of Foreign Service. And probably most um, relevantly for this discussion, I was at Yahoo for 10 years uh, and was a deputy general counsel. I was there from 2000 to 2010. Um, so the early and mid 2000s was really a period of global expansion uh, for uh, the technology companies that existed at the time. So I would say principally Yahoo, Microsoft, um, Google, um, hardware companies like Cisco, that led to uh, what are some now well-documented challenges in international markets, including China. Um, that in turn led to a call for a code of conduct around freedom of expression and privacy. Um, there are intensive negotiations uh, that culminated in the 2008 launch of the Global Network Initiative, a multi-stakeholder initiative made up of um, technology companies, civil society members, press freedom advocates, socially responsible investors and academics. Um, and a cornerstone of the GNI was and is uh, accountability. Uh, and a core component of accountability is transparency. Um, so if I can just offer one uh, anecdote, I recall uh, where I was, um, although not the exact date, we were in the offices of the Center for Democracy and Technology in early 2010 and a colleague from Google um, approached uh, us in this small confidential kind of trusted setting and announced that Google would be issuing um, a report. It was not yet called a transparency report, but would be issuing a report um, giving information on the law enforcement demands uh, that Google had received. Uh, and it would include information on numbers of disclosures and types of disclosures. Um, and I have to say, um, at the time, given that I had worked uh, closely uh, and regularly with Yahoo's global law enforcement team on public safety, uh, national security related issues and uh, speech and privacy issues, I was um, surprised. Um, I thought it was bold. Um, and I have to admit that there was concern uh, in the industry. Um, but I looked 10 years later uh, and I think that is the norm. It's a standard across industry. Um, if I can misuse kind of a public policy concept, um, Google essentially shifted the Overton window. Um, and I should also note that there was um, successful, important advocacy by groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, CDT itself, and others um, who had pushed for transparency in particular on the US side um, and Google really um, took a bold step. And what I, um, I, I wanna uh, kind of close that anecdote by noting, there's a lot more work to do. And, and I think we can talk about that as, as we continue the discussion. Um, but I wanna come back to you, Nicole, and ask you about your role leading a business and human rights program and describing for us how transport, transparency reporting kind of fits inside the company in the broader kind of cons inside the broader concept of transparency. 
Yeah. And I mean, I think that the history that you shared is so important to sort of understand as we, you know, consider where this fits within um, companies, you know, where it's fit over time and where it fits today. At Verizon, our work rests on a set of key pillars. And one of those pillars is um, accountability and transparency, as you were alluding to. And I think, you know, we in our company recognize that transparency is an important way that we can communicate about how um, how how governments are impacting uh, human rights through their law and through their policy and also about the role of companies in respecting human rights. And it's for that reason or those reasons that our company has placed a high priority on transparency reporting for um, a long time now, really since, you know, the origins of this program and um, all the way back to Yahoo. And so to give a little bit of an example, I was sort of thinking about, you know, the evolution just within our company of these practices. And when Verizon Media, our tech and media arm, um, was formed a couple of years ago following Yahoo's acquisition by Verizon, um, we had as a first priority really among, you know, what we were uh, working on at the time post-acquisition to publish a new transparency report, transparency reporting hub really, for Verizon Media that would house the transparency um, reports and information for our house of brands, including brands like Yahoo and AOL. And at the time we were really bringing together a number of different um, internet technology media brands and we had this opportunity. So we set out to standardize reporting on government requests for user data, content moderation, um, produce new and combined sets of disclosures uh, that went beyond what any of our individual brands had done before. And I think part of why we were, you know, maybe poised and able to take advantage of that opportunity that came about and do some advance, make some advancements in our transparency reporting was partially because we have a dedicated team in place in our company who's focused on these issues for the duration of its existence um, and was able to step in at a time of significant transition and transformation and realize that transparency and accountability are premium um, in this work and that there should be attention on those early on. But also, you know, that our team and our company had been engaged on these issues in discussion with external, um, you know, partners, groups, organizations. So I was thinking back when I first started at Yahoo, the first conversation I joined in uh, the Global Network Initiative, the multi-stakeholder organization in this space was actually around um, practices uh, in the transparency reporting area. Um, there was a new practice around government um, reporting on government requests for content removal. And at the time, you know, that was sort of the next generation um, step from the government uh, request for user data and what had been reported on those. And so it was an early conversation about, you know, what was best practice, what was emerging, like what could be learned. Um, and those conversations in GNI have only been, you know, rich over time and helped inform our, our practice. And of course, we've also engaged with other groups that have come up over more recent years, like ranking digital rights that's looked at what is meaningful transparency and how does transparency impact uh, practice, you know, and how can you think about that, especially as a, a someone who works on these issues within the company, that's been a useful dialogue to be part of. And then, of course, we've had so many of these type of discussions um, at Access Now's RightsCon over the years. So, you know, really without this sort of engagement, um, I think the whole practice, you know, wouldn't be as rich as it is today. So I know we're almost nearing our time um, to wrap up. Michael, what do you see? Can you give us your forecast for the challenges, the opportunities ahead, you know, uh, look into the future and tell us what's coming? Um, I, I'm not sure how far into the future I can look, but I will uh, note that I think the challenges and the opportunities are really one and the same. And I thought that um, we could um, just spend a minute on, on three of the challenges slash opportunities. Um, the first is audience, and I think it's important to think about transparency reporting, kind of to step back and think about who the audience is for these reports, but really for the concept of transparency overall. Um, it's consumers, 
it's um, governments, it's academics, it's civil society organizations, um, it's the press, it's um, really, it's all of those. It's not a single one. Um, and that leads to kind of the second area with, where I think we have both challenges and opportunities. Um, these are the most, among the most innovative companies in history, but I feel like from that first moment when I heard about what became a transparency report and when I subsequently saw it a few weeks later in 2010, um, there hasn't been sufficient innovation. Um, there are some kind of companies that are noteworthy in the user friendliness and digestibility um, of the transparency reports that they publish and credit to them. And, and I hope that some of those um, steps become more standardized uh, across industry in the US and outside um, for certain, but it feels like there's much more room on kind of understanding the various audiences and making a tool and the same way you would design, you know, a really useful uh, and well-used product um, to think about transpar transparency reporting in that way. Um, the third challenge and opportunity uh, for the companies, and I look forward to the, to the panel discussion afterward, is really around breadth and depth. Um, I think we need to think more holistically about transparency as a cornerstone of accountability and not just focus on law enforcement demands, whether in the US, outside the US, and there can be more detail. We need, we need that, we need more detail. Um, the Snowden revelations showed that sort of multi-stakeholder advocacy um, could lead to advances uh, in transparency reporting. But we need to think about it in the same context, but I would give an example of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I don't mean just in hiring or in the composition of uh, companies, but in the design, development, deployment of products, um, DEI principles need to be a core part of that. And we need to have companies sort of think holistically about how they're transparent with the entire community of stakeholders that I mentioned. We need more, certainly on law enforcement, more on content moderation, more on political ads, um, more on general consumer uh, data collection, uh, activities. And you mentioned Nicole uh, ranking digital rights uh, and that project and the indicators, I think, um, provide us all really a good starting place and, and often a roadmap. Um, so I'll kind of close by saying that Google did indeed um, move us forward. It was, a, it was an enormous leap and credit to the company. Um, but if I could, for the runners kind of among us, um, note, it's been more like kind of a corporate walk or a corporate race, um, you know, leisurely moving steadily with a goal, but the stakes are too high. Um, and it feels like we need an Olympian effort. And, um, and I look forward to hearing the panel discussion uh, and seeing the questions. I feel like there's much, much more to do here and credit to those who have been innovators in the space. And thank you again um, to Access and to BSR for hosting us. Well, thank you so much to you, Michael, and to Nicole for that insightful conversation. Um, we've asked uh, a few companies to present on their reports, as well as uh, Greg Walters from the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board to talk about transparency reporting metrics. So we'll also hear from Patrick Casilius of Telia Company, from Kakao, and from Uttara Sivaram of Uber um, on their approaches to transparency reporting. Hi all, good morning, uh, afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you may be. My name is Greg Waters and I am from the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, most often known as SASB. So th thanks so much to Access Now for, for allowing me a few minutes to speak here and plug an important research project that's ongoing uh, at SASB. So we are an independent nonprofit standard setting organization and we're dedicated to facilitating the disclosure of financially impactful environmental and social issues from companies to their investors. Uh, we exist because we believe that capital markets are a critical lever for, for achieving a more sustainable and just future. Our standards are industry-specific and designed to capture a subset of information, uh, sustainability information, that is most likely to impact financial performance of companies. And we are actively backed by a group of investors with around $60 trillion in assets under management. And uh, we are being, our standards are being used to report 
by about 500 different companies uh, across 70 different industries. Uh, and that growth is about 350% year on year. So we're really excited by the momentum we've achieved uh, as an organization in driving for more comparable and complete sustainability disclosure. Um, this, this audience understands why transparency around things like data privacy and content governance are, are really important societally. Um, but there's also this financial impact angle, and, and that's why SASB has gotten involved. So I thought I'd spend a, a moment or two uh, speaking to that. So uh, the first line item I would say is, is on the revenue side. And I think if we think about content governance as what users see on, on a given platform and when, uh, that really is critical to uh, you know, a company's business strategy, how they attract and retain not just users, but also uh, advertisers. And, and that balance of um, you know, monitoring for harmful content uh, while, while protecting user freedom of expression, uh, we see different uh, approaches and strategies taken by different platforms depending on the design of, of their platform. Uh, from the cost perspective, uh, of course, we now know that thousands, if not tens of thousands of people at, at various companies are, are, are reviewing content uh, and uh, that, that obviously is a significant form of investment. Uh, the other would be the capital expenditure associated with automated flagging systems using techniques like machine learning. And the last thing I would mention on the financial side would be the regulatory piece uh, in that we, we know that the U.S. and, uh, and the European Commission as well with the Digital Services Act um, are, are mulling proposed changes that would severely uh, potentially impact uh, how companies not just moderate but also kind of, you know, really show content to users. So uh, major implications there in terms of if you're thinking of this with an investor lens in terms of risk return profile, um, you know, how might a different company's um, platform be impacted by different regulations is cl clear clearly of interest. So in terms of uh, transparency reporting, um, obviously they're, they're critical for accountability to a, a broad variety of stakeholders, but also the metrics that have been developed and are being used by a number of companies uh, on areas like content moderation are also uh, of interest to investors. So SASB standards actually already use a number of transparency reporting metrics. Uh, these include uh, information about law enforcement uh, data sharing, as well as uh, content removal requests from governments. Um, the next piece for SASB is we are now evaluating uh, potential changes to our standards to include voluntary content moderation and, and content governance themes. So really, really eager to, uh, to hear from companies and subject matter experts, uh, such as the people uh, on the panel that's about to come up here. Uh, we, are, we are open, we're a, a market informed and, and consensus and con stakeholder driven organization uh, in terms of understanding what are the most important uh, issues and, and the best ways to be capturing uh, the, the, the performance of companies on this topic. So, so eager to, to connect. So, so thanks again to Access Now for having me and allowing me to, to, to plug this project. Uh, and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Take care, everyone. Hi, all. My name is Patrick Hiselius. I'm representing Telia Company, an ISP and mobile operator and TV provider in the Nordic and uh, Baltics. And um, if you want to know more about Telia Company, please visit our homepage, teliacompany.com. So I'm glad Access Now uh, provides access to a database on uh, transparency reports and now also gives access to this event about transparency reporting. And thanks for inviting Telia Company. Uh, although I understand uh, our reporting is one of the most read uh, pieces on our homepage, it's difficult for me to know what you watching this event are looking for and how, therefore, for us to improve. So please have a look and give us feedback on how to improve. Both positives and negatives, thanks. Uh, at Telia Company, we say law enforcement disclosure reporting and not transparency report, because we do transparency in all areas of sustainability. That might be uh, children's rights or environment or our work in the supply chain, uh, gender equality and so forth. And also on human rights impact assessments. The following are the two starting points for TLA companies reporting. First and foremost, we encourage states to be transparent themselves about their use and scope of surveillance. 
We welcome, therefore, the yearly transparency reports published by the governments, in, uh, such as uh, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Norway and Lithuania. So, please do encourage states to do transparency reporting. To supplement those reports from states, our aim at Tela Company is to contribute to meaningful and uh, uh, oversight and discussion. So we publish these reports twice a year, a full report with context and other information uh, each March, and then an update of the law enforcement requests each October. And we've done so since 2013. Secondly, as a side effect, our work to be transparent helps us in getting things in order uh, because when we publish information, it needs to be correct. Over the years, we've added additional transparency to the actual statistics of law enforcement requests. So, in, in addition to uh, our statistics, statistics on the day-to-day -day, thousands of conventional lawful intercept requests, we also provide information on unconventional requests and the number of such. That's about blocking, shutdowns, new legislation, etc. And how we have dealt with those. Secondly, we have added links to laws providing states with direct access. Three, we have also added links to laws mandating operators to do data retention for surveillance. We have also added the links to the government's own reporting. And we've added uh, uh, information on the extent of use of cell tower dumps and lots of context and more. So I invite you to have a look into our latest March uh, 2020 report. One feature of Telia Company's reporting, which I don't know if other companies do, is that our figures are audited, just as our financials. So Deloitte look into our uh, figures and also ask sometimes about uh, supporting documentation so that they can audit our figures. So, which are the main challenges as to this reporting? We have a chapter in our March report on challenges and omissions. The biggest challenge, notably, is that the statistics on number of surveillance requests don't provide the full picture. Governments also have direct access real-time network access without requests. Regarding such direct access, Telia Company has no insight into the extent of surveillance, when, who and what, and cannot provide statistics. What we can do, as we do in our reporting, is to publish links to such relevant laws in our respective markets. And as part of the Global Network Initiative, the GNI, we address this salient issue of direct access. Another challenge I wanted to mention here is that some readers try to compare figures between the countries. Several factors make it difficult to compare the statistics between countries. Telia, of course, had, have different market shares in different markets and also the working methods uh, within the authorities differ and we don't know about their priorities and working methods. So, a very short summary. Thanks Access Now for arranging this important event. I myself look forward to uh, look at the stream. Uh, on our reporting, first, why we do it? Well, our responsibility is to respect your privacy. But there are laws which mandate uh, us to hand over data for uh, surveillance. What we can do is to be transparent about that, how many requests we get, and the context about uh, on, on such requests. Some things I try to highlight in this intervention. One is that Telia company statistics is audited, and also a main challenge for transparency is direct access, where we cannot provide statistics. So do give us feedback, positive, negative, and on how we can improve. Uh, my Twitter handle is Patrick underscore 
Hiselius. Many thanks and uh, take care. Thanks. Digital responsibility for protecting user privacy. Kakao Transparency Report. Warm greetings from Korea. We are Kakao's policy team, and we are honored to be speaking to you at RightsCon about our transparency report. Kakao makes a better world with people and technology. As a mobile platform company, the privacy and protection of our users is top priority. Our goal for the transparency report is to present a comprehensive data set on the requests and status of requests made by government agencies for user information. This is one of the actions we take to strengthen transparency in ensuring the digital security of our users. Since 2012, we have been publishing the transparency report every six months. Here, we see the statistical data that are included in the transparency report for the first half of this year. We report the number of requests made by the Korean government regarding user information and the status of cases and accounts duly processed. The type of information that the government may request for are as follows. Communication data, communication restricting measures, communication confirmation data, and search and seizure warrants. Kakao does not process requests for individual user information by government agencies without respecting official procedures. We make great efforts to increase people's access to information by improving the readability of our content. We present clear explanations on the terms, standards, and procedures relevant to the disclosure of user information in simple language on our website. The Transparency Report is a part of Kakao's efforts to fulfill our digital responsibility. First of all, it is significant in terms of the protection of user rights. It allows us to transparently report and release data on how we are handling government requests for user information. Secondly, as Kakao observes due processes on requests by government agencies, we believe that it is our responsibility entrusted to us by users to disclose such data in the transparency report so that everyone may view it. Lastly, Kakao's transparency report not only encompasses our endeavor to ensure user rights, but it also expresses our pride in keeping our users' information strictly guarded according to legal procedures. In such a dynamic and unstable digital environment, we make every effort to protect our users' rights and to fulfill our corporate responsibilities and promises. Committed to the promises we have made, Kakao strives to provide open and resourceful information for our users. In light of the COVID-19 crisis, we have published the Kakao COVID-19 report and aims to support the public with data and to share the ongoing national and global efforts in overcoming its challenges. As Korea's leading digital daily life platform, Kakao reveals analysis results on the pre- and post-pandemic changes in user data of Kakao services in the Kakao COVID-19 report. Please contact our team to learn more about our analyses. Let us all safely and wisely maneuver through these times. Take care. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Uttara Sivaram, and I uh, lead Uber's public policy work on privacy and security, including the publication of our government transparency report. First of all, uh, thank you to Access Now for hosting this event. Uh, transparency reporting is incredibly important to holding companies and governments accountable, and it's good to take a step back and see how this practice has grown and evolved over the past decade. Uber published its first transparency report for a ride-sharing business in 2016, following in the footsteps of some of the companies being featured today. But in addition to counting the requests we received from law enforcement, our report was the first in the mobility space to include regulatory requests for data from government agencies like the California Public Utilities Commission and the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. And that's because our business is a little different. Our technology connects riders and drivers both online and in the real world, a world that's regulated by agencies overseeing things like transportation, energy, and construction. And the data they usually ask us for involves Uber trips, where people go by using our platform. But even after names are excluded from this data, this information still carries the risk that passengers can be re-identified by examining patterns of movement and combining them with publicly available information. 
For example, if someone takes a ride to the grocery store from their home and the origin and destination of that trip is disclosed to the government, it can be a simple matter of using the yellow pages to identify who took that trip. And that's why, in every case, we work closely with government agencies to understand the legal basis for their request and make sure we're, not, we're only providing what is strictly necessary. Beyond that, we use technical privacy methods like coarsening the resolution of location data and timestamps to reduce the uniqueness of every trip. By doing that, we reduce the risk that this information can be used to identify our users. And in many cases, regulators have altered their requirements in recognition of the privacy risks their requests can create. By publishing this report and including requests from these types of agencies, we want to stimulate a much needed conversation about government access to data, both within and outside of law enforcement. And for every year we've released our report, we've seen a steady rise in the number of these requests, as well as the number of users impacted as people turn to connected mobility options that they can access from their phone. Moving forward, it's, it's really important that we not only urge more companies to release transparency reports, but also encourage a greater variety of companies to participate. That's the only way to fully capture how data flows between the private and public sectors. Furthermore, having a fuller picture of government data sharing across different sectors can help inform better and smarter regulation addressing how governments can and should access information about users. We can all, I'm sure, envision a world that's powered by smart, uh, data-driven public policy, as well as a user base that feels empowered and in control of their, of their own data. That's why in addition to publishing these reports, we as an industry need to invest in solutions that leverage aggregated and anonymized data that can drive positive social outcomes without putting consumer privacy at risk. There's a tremendous opportunity to learn from one another and improve transparency reporting. And I know Uber is eager to work with many of the companies and consumer advocates here today to accomplish that. Thank you and I'm happy to stay on afterwards for, for any questions. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, that concludes the, uh, the presentations and the, the videos. So now we're going to go to the live content. Uh, we've got uh, an amazing panel of speakers here today. Um, and uh, without further ado, we'll get started. Uh, I'd love to hear reactions to that. We've, we've heard from um, speakers all over the world, from a variety of types of companies, um, those who were you know, around this process 10 years ago and before, um, as well as those who've uh, just started. Um, about half the folks on this panel work at organizations or companies um, that didn't exist 10 years ago, uh, but we've grown. With power comes responsibility, with user growth comes abuse reports and disinformation campaigns, search warrants, and even executive orders. Um, in my perch at Access Now, uh, leading our business and human rights work and as general counsel, um, I've been able to watch this trend. And I would argue that outside events, even crises, have driven reporting. Voluntary disclosures are not high on the list for most startups or even maturing tech companies. Uh, looking at the Access Now Transparency Reporting Index, we see a bump of reports uh, in around 2014, 2015. I would argue that's due to the revelations of mass surveillance um, that Edward Snowden uh, brought to the world. Civil society uh, jumped on these moments and others in 2016, like the Brexit campaign, the 2016 US presidential vote, as well as the Me Too movement to drive reporting on terms of service and community guideline enforcement, as well as advertising transparency. And I'd love for the panelists to refute my theses uh, but I do think that most tech companies, like other institutions, know that transparency builds trust and can even help keep other stakeholders in check. So we'll ask this panel what trends they're seeing in the coming years, uh, how we've gotten to where we are now, and how all tech companies, uh, including you know, any number of new sectors um, who exist now or who are coming online, uh, can better Get, a her get ahead of the curve on reporting and uh, respect the human rights of their communities. So without further ado, I think it's, it's proper to go um, straight to, to Google, to uh, Alex 
Walden, who is a veteran of the company, now global head of human rights. Uh, this is, as we've heard, the company that pioneered transparency reporting 10 years ago. Um, I'd love to ask Alex why Google started reporting. Um, is there lore? Have you heard stories? Um, but perhaps more importantly, uh, given the downtrend in, in some reports, a lot of companies put out one and they're done, um, as well as the, the rather notorious uh, reputation at Google to, to start projects and then kill them. Um, why has Google continued and even expanded its reporting? Um, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Peter. Um, and thank you to Access Now again for hosting this conversation. Uh, human rights, transparency, and tech is near and dear to my heart and is really core to the work that I do at Google. Um, so why did we start doing transparency reporting? If you rewind, and some of this is what uh, Michael and um, Nicole hit on, but if you rewind back to the early 2000s, that was really the early days of when companies started receiving government requests for user data, government requests for information or to remove content. Um, and so as we started to get these requests and push back on them, we started to feel like there um, it was an important principle for us to think about what it meant for us to be transparent with our users about both what the company was doing and what governments were doing, the interaction between the two. Uh, and so, you know, over a decade ago, we launched this effort to provide some of that information publicly. Then in September of 2010, it actually uh, became itself a transparency report. And for us, we really do think it is about our users' trust and it is also core to our commitment to human rights. And both of those pieces are important to how we continue to think about it. Uh, since then, we have launched, I think we are now at 12 different transparency reports. So it is uh, something that we remain committed to. We started with user data. We went to government requests for um, removal of content. And now we have reports on things like copyright. We have th reports on things like um, traffic, uh, internet traffic. Um, regarding ads. And um, in 2018, we launched the YouTube transparency report. So we really have continued to iterate and expand on the breadth of areas of the business where we think it's important for us to share with users, both how we're interacting with government and how we're enforcing our own policies against our products. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I think one area um, as well that, that Google and others have started reporting is around uh, demographics and, and staff data. And I think uh, building off Michael Samway's remarks, maybe we can hear more about that. Um, cool. Um, I want to swing over to uh, to Reddit. Um, actually, we are going in, in order of uh, seniority here. Reddit uh, was started in 2005. It's mature despite its image. Um, it was started on the, the East Coast. It's a social news aggregation and web content rating and discussion forum app and website uh, with up to 52 million daily active users globally. Um, that's up a lot during COVID. And uh, I, I think we want to hear from Jessica Shu, the director of policy there, um, about how their reporting has innovated over the past uh, couple of years, with Reddit being really at the heart of social movements as well as the, the COVID-19 response. Um, Jessica, welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. Happy to speak to those issues. So Reddit um, issued its first transparency report in 2014 in uh, the bump of transparency reports that you just cited. Um, we're, we're proud that we've been doing them for so long and we're proud that um, we've been expanding them um, every year and also that we've been recognized as a leader in the transparency reporting space. So for example, we were the only company to receive a perfect score in the last EFF who has your back evaluation of company transparency. And so we really do think um, deeply about this. And it's important to us, um, especially because of Reddit's unique structure. So we follow, um, as you're familiar, a community moderation model where the users themselves on a volunteer basis are highly involved in um, our content moderation operations. So, you know, a statistic that is in our transparency report that we disclose is that actually more than 99.7% of all content removals on Reddit actually happen at the user level by these volunteer moderators. And so because 
the users and the public really are partners with us in moderating the Reddit platform, it's really important that we disclose this data with them so that we can um, have a, a healthy relationship where our policies are understood and our actions are understood. Um, like other companies, we used to focus only on government requests in our transparency disclosures. Um, but um, as I mentioned before, we've been expanding that out. Um, and now it includes um, reporting on content removal actions that we take as a company in line um, with our content policy. Um, and that was a really kind of big expansion for us. We've been doing that for the last two to three years now. And it taught us a lot about um, how to do transparency reporting and how to um, work cross-functionally with partners in the company to kind of get the data that you need. And I think that this is one of the, the biggest perceived barriers to companies doing transparency reports, especially for smaller companies like Reddit. Um, you know, we're only around 700 total employees right now. Um, but you know, I think the biggest hurdle that's perceived to reporting something for the first time is making sure that you actually have the data tracked. Because of course, if you don't track it, you can't disclose it. And so there's actually kind of a year long ahead of time preparation process that needs to happen um, before you do your transparency report because it may entail tooling adjustments, which takes, um, engineering resources that are often pretty constrained at smaller companies. Um, but what I, say when I'm talking to kind of my colleagues at smaller companies who are thinking of transparency reporting or they want to do one but they don't think that they have the data or they don't think that they have the right data is that it's really really important not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good um, because you know if you don't have a specific thing tracked or you don't have it tracked for the whole year you know you might have an approximate data point tracked or you know you could report for the data that you have and then kind of start tracking it and do a full one next year um, it's important to think creatively about what's meaningful to disclose um, for your platform in particular, because I think it's important that to recognize that a meaningful transparency report is going to be really different for every platform because we all represent kind of different models and different services and products. And that's okay. And I know that that can sometimes be frustrating for researchers and others because they want to see um, an apples to apples comparison of transparency reports across the industry. But the reality is that these are not apples to apples services. Reddit is very different from Google, is very different from Uber, um, and our transparency reports each reflect that. Um, and then kind of thoughts on continuing to expand transparency reporting um, and where the trends are going in the future. I think um, it's very, important to remember that transparency isn't just something that needs to happen once a year, or twice a year, or quarterly or whatever your cadence is with, with your reports. Um, I think it's important to think about transparency as kind of a company value. Um, one of our values is default open. Um, and also think about how you can integrate transparency efforts into the things that you're doing all year. And so for example, you know, 2020 was a very particular year with very particular challenges. And one of those challenges was um, the racial justice reckoning in the United States. And as a part of that kind of national conversation that we were having, um, Reddit updated our content policy to more explicitly um, prohibit hateful content. Um, and when you're making a significant um, content policy update like that, it's really important to measure it and see if it's working. And so, you know, while this might be a deep dive that's not kind of appropriate for the um, format of the annual transparency report, we really wanted to communicate with our users about what we were finding and what we were seeing. Um, and so we created a dedicated subreddit where we talk about kind of interesting things that we want to disclose to the users, but they might, might not be right or fit into the transparency report. And so we discussed statistics um, that we had found about how much um, hateful content we had found on Reddit before and after the rule change. And we also discussed, you know, who was that hateful content targeted at? And that's a really important point because one of the really great things about transparency reporting is that 
it helps you understand your own business better. And there's a really strong business case to be made for doing transparency reporting because um, I can now go to my trust and safety team and say, we've got statistics here that say that most hateful content on Reddit is um, involving racial issues and kind of less hateful content is involving kind of other types of issues. So that gives our safety team a lot of really valuable insights about where they want to direct their efforts. And so um, there's a there's a powerful business case there um, that you can make because it ultimately um, saves some resources because we're not misdirecting kind of valuable engineering resources or valuable trust and safety resources to something that's not gonna end up having a significant impact on the platform. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, so many great points there. I think uh, you know, and you really pulled out your dependence on those. I guess volunteer moderators. They're not paid, right? And with, I think this was a, a necessity, being the mother of invention. You you were a small company, and I think you you still are relatively small, despite these fifty million active users. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear more uh, also about your, your global reach. And so how do you ensure that these policies that you roll out are understood and, and are respected um, when even when you're dependent on volunteer moderators? Yeah, absolutely. That's um, it's a conversation that we're actively thinking about in the company. Um, but I think what's great about kind of the decentralized community moderation model is that it internationalizes and localizes a lot better than a centralized um, um, in enforcement model because, you know, for example, something like hate speech is hugely contextually dependent. It's, you know, very sophisticated language. It relies on slang. It's often coded in the community moderators who are a part of that community are going to be able to recognize something much better than we'll be able to recognize it, you know, sitting in San Francisco or sitting in New York or wherever we are. So um, we've been focusing on having more intentional conversations with these moderators and kind of creating moderator councils really where we um, speak you know, directly over Zoom with kind of groups of our moderators to just understand what they're seeing so that nice. we can um, better direct our resources to building things that are gonna be meaningful for them for keeping their communities safe. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I imagine uh, you'll get some upvotes for that response. Um, let's. Uh, let's move to, yeah, the, the other uh, company on our platform and, I, and on our panel, and I am going to pri um, prioritize the companies here first. Uh, Sean Lee at an even smaller firm, Discord, even newer, only about five years old, but uh, also growing a lot during the COVID pandemic while folks are at home and, and looking to reach out and make social connections. Um, Discord has been called Slack for gamers, but uh, it's, it's rapidly expanding right beyond uh, that community. Um, and uh, you've done a lot of reporting around trust and safety. I want to say you're the only firm that actually reports the raw numbers of all the user flags you get. So I'd love to hear about, um, uh, about your work there. Uh, and just to, to call out that you are the third USF law alum, Go Dons on this panel. So thanks for, thanks for joining us, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. Happy, happy to be here, and, and thanks to Access Now for for um, putting in all the hard work on on such an important topic. Um, I, I mean, actually, as as Jessica said, right? Like, I think meaningful transparency reporting is is different across companies, and and I think that's actually where sort of our uh, focus on on user flagging and and on enforcement came from. That I think a lot of what we sort of saw uh, in the really in, in our user base and in the discussion was that there was kind of, right, like enforcement is often a black box, right? And you don't really know why decisions are being made. You don't know how they're being made. Like you, there's just a lot of like uncertainty of like, oh, like why did my account get banned? Why did this post come down? And so I think we, we really approach it from that level of like, oh, this is an area where there is a lot of uncertainty, where there's a lot of lack of clarity and, and we wanted to to address that. For for us, I think the, the transparency reporting really comes from, right, like it, it is about about showing users like what is going on and users, civil society, right, the press, like what's going on, what it looks like. We, I think the analogy is sort of that like we look at these transparency reports, especially on the enforcement side, kind of like 
mm, annual crime reports that like a city or a state issues, right? In the same way that you sort of probably want to know what like a city's crime rate looks like across various things before you move there, it probably also makes sense that you would kind of want to know what your online space looks like before you go there. Um, and so that that was sort of the root of um, us, us driving us. I, I do think that there are a number of companies now that are reporting, you know, content uh, enforcement actions to some degree. Um, and I think it really like depends on the, the company, right, on you can imagine that at some of the right like because discord tends to be a more private company um right like you have to have an account you have to join servers you can't just sort of like drive by and browse right like i think the reporting metrics are different which is why i think it is hard um as mentioned to sort of compare these things apples to apples but i think by and large right the more transparency that we can sort of bring on any of these topics right the the better it is um the the one other thing on being a small company yeah we're i think we're a little bit over 280 people right now and we've done transparency reports now for uh, three cycles, so six months, right? A bit over a year and a half. Um, I think it really is about just prioritizing it and making sure that you make those investments early, right? The earlier on you spend time and resources on uh, on being able to gather the data, collate the data, and make sure that you're presenting it well, the easier it is later on. You don't have to wait, right? Like we we went from you know sub 50 million users to 100 million daily users over the last year or so, and we just put a lot of that infrastructure in in 20. 18, and that's all paid off now. Um, I think as with a lot of companies, as with I think every company really here, certainly, you know, we continue to try and make transparency reporting better. And part of that is giving more context, right? Part of that is uh, making it accessible, not just I think to civil society that is interested in sort of seeing what things look like from, uh, from across every platform, but also like talking actually directly to our users and being like, hey, when you report a user for harassment, this is what happens, right? This is what it looks like. This is like what you can expect. Because I, I think at the end of the day, right, like having a model that kind of is more, maybe a little bit closer to, for example, the American judiciary model, right? Where you, in most cases, can actually see like how a case went down and what happened to it, right? Like what the entire sort of like steps in the investigation, in the prosecution, in the assessment were, right? Mm -hmm. I think that engenders the trust in the company, right? In, in the process really that I think we're all looking for, so. Thanks, John. Yeah, I, I, I did want to ask, you know, because you were in tech, I think in trust and safety, even before going to law school and then came out, were there rules? It, it sounds like you you took a lot from the process of law um, and, you know, maybe in due process and, and are applying it here. Are there are there rules? Are there substantive rules, say the UN guiding principles on business and human rights um, that you're also drawing from uh, in the law? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think the, the fields of trust and safety and, and um, content moderation and the law are, are pretty close, right? Not just for, I think, you know, regulatory reasons or stuff like that, but I think that fundamentally the study of law is really, right, like a study of the systems, you know, contractual systems that allow society to operate. Um, and I would say that, you know, from uh, both, of course, like history and how governments currently operate, and of course, the excellent work that all of these NGOs are doing, right, there's a lot of stuff that we draw from to understand how trust and safety processes at Discord should work. Awesome, thanks. And uh, yeah, I, I think our next speaker is gonna be able to provide that, um, that macro overview again. Dunstan Allison Hope is uh, vice president at BSR. BSR uh, predates even Google, founded in 1992, um, and has uh, really been, was at the forefront and continues at, uh, at the forefront of the trend of business uh, respect for sustainability and human rights. Um, Dunstan, I, I'm wondering, uh, we've drilled down from, you know, some of the largest tech companies to, to some of the newest and smallest. Um, where uh, is the tech sector in comparison with, with uh, the rest of the business universe? Um, I, I'd love for you, uh, you to give us an overview. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Peter. And I was going to Open by saying as nearly 30 years old, we're probably the oldest organization on the, on the panel here, and you stole my line. Um, so first of all, thank you for hosting this important discussion. We have been working with companies on issues of transparency across a range of different issues going back to the early 1990s. And so it's been really encouraging to see the evolution of transparency reporting in the technology industry over the past uh, decade or so. And so when I think when it comes to issues of transparency around relationships with law enforcement agencies, how companies share data with law enforcement agencies, as well as the broader sort of content uh, governance field, I think the technology industry stands way ahead of, of other industries. And I think in reflecting about the 
past decade of transparency reporting and thinking about the next decade, uh, the key sort of thought that came to mind for me is that what we'd like to see over the next decade are more transparency reports <clears throat> published by companies outside of the technology industry. Uh, so, you know, while the scope of transparency reporting has evolved over time, I still think at their core, it covers the relationships companies have with law enforcement agencies, how they manage those relationships and how they share data with, with law enforcement agencies. Uh, but of course, tech companies are not the only ones that have those relationships. Tech companies are not the only companies that share data with law enforcement agencies. Um, whether it's the retail industry, financial services, healthcare, travel, automotive, logistics, all of those industries in different ways have relationships with law enforcement and share data. And so what we'd like to see are reports from companies across um, a much wider range of issues, um, sorry, a much wider range of, of industries covering some of the is similar issues to those that are covered in uh, technology industry transparency reports. Now, somebody made the point, you know, who are the audiences? Transparency for what purpose? And I think for us, we undertake a lot of human rights due diligence with companies. And we find the transparency reports to be a really helpful contribution to that human rights due diligence. And um, both because the company has got its own sort of house in order ahead of time. And so there's an organized way of understanding the company's impact on privacy or other human rights, for example. Um, but also it gives us a sort of head start. You know, if we're doing a human rights assessment for a telecoms company or an internet company, a transparency report gives you a head start on that process. And my fear, is that when we do human rights due diligence with companies in other industries, we lack some of that insight on how they might impact rights to privacy or how other rights may be impacted as a result of violations to privacy rights and how that might manifest itself in a range of, of other contexts. And this isn't just voluntary. I mean, I think when this started, this was largely voluntary, right? But we're moving to a world where where regulation is going to be driving company action, right? Um, can you tell us about what might be coming um, uh, in the EU, especially around human rights due diligence? Yeah, so in the EU, there are proposals for mandatory human rights due diligence by companies. And so that would be pretty much all companies of all industries of, of all sizes. And they would be expected to apply an approach that's very similar to that, which is in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And so that means reviewing your, all of your activities across your entire value chain against all human rights. And so what intrigues me is if companies from non-technology industries do that effectively, they are inevitably going to come up against how we share data with law enforcement agencies and how we collaborate with law enforcement agencies. So I wonder whether that uh, regulatory process is going to result in greater understanding of these issues in, in other sectors. And, you know, we were founded uh, 30 years ago, what have you, before many of the technology companies that exist today exist. And so we're working on human rights uh, impacts with companies from a range of other industries. And so that's something we're really looking forward to um, over the coming decade. Thanks so much, Dunstan. So uh, we've heard from uh, the people producing the reports. We've heard from the, the person uh, telling the companies to produce the reports. And uh, now I think it's time to hear from those who actually use and, and read, you know, who's the audience for these? Uh, th this is the point where if we were at RightsCon, I'd, I'd asked a poll of who's actually read a full transparency report that, that they didn't write um, and, uh, and, and who's found them useful in their work. Um, so maybe you at home can just um, raise your hand. Uh, let's go to Louise Matsakis, um, an experienced journalist uh, at publications like Wired and Motherboard, but is now writing at a fantastic new nonprofit journalism project, Rest of World, uh, founded by a former tech exec, Rest of World tells stories where tech, culture, and human experience collide. Um, Louise, welcome. And uh, can you tell us uh, who are these reports for, and uh, do you think they're successful um, at, at uh, telling a story? Might be muted. Um, we needed one person. To Can you hear me now? 
Yep. Is that working? Okay. Uh, so I think one thing that's good to note is that rest of world doesn't cover the West. So that's sort of where the name comes from. We only cover Asia, Africa, South America, Latin America, uh, and sort of Eastern Europe. So these reports are incredibly important to our reporting, especially because these are often governments that are not transparent whatsoever. Uh, and these transparency reports give really important insight into how these governments are behaving. For example, we saw India block TikTok this year, and it was really interesting to look at TikTok's transparency report and see that India was one of the top uh, you know, governments that was requesting data from the company. And that indicated to me that they were you know, potentially upset with some of the content on the platform, right? They had a high number of removal requests. And you know, that told me a story that was different from the story that the Indian government was, was saying, which was that this was about you know, India-China relations. Uh, but to me, the transparency report kind of showed that instead this was a story about perhaps censorship uh, and about wanting to you know, clamp down on free expression. So these reports are incredibly important for showing those sorts of trends. Uh, they really provide a lot of uh, insight into what governments are doing in places where they don't really want to speak to journalists like me. Uh, I think that there are ways that they're not working. Uh, for example, I have noticed that a lot of companies turn to transparency reports long after they have faced scandals over content moderation or over government surveillance. For example, we saw that a lot with Zoom this year, uh, and Zoom actually missed the first deadline to release its transparency report, and it's still sort of TBD about when they're going to release it. Uh, and that brings up another point that Dunstan was making is that we see a lot of companies like Google have a great legacy here with transparency reporting, but I really want to see a wider range of tech companies that are handling user data. Uh, that's, you know, both like telcos, that's sort of like uh, software like uh, uh, Zoom. And I really want to see sort of like not just the major social platforms take up this initiative. And I hope that sort of pressure from government regulation will make that more possible. Uh, but this is a really important practice. And I think that, uh, you know, a lot of journalists like me would be worse off without transparency reporting. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, and uh, can you can you expand though and tell us more about um, how this is useful uh, in other countries and and whether this practice is actually being taken up by non-Western companies? Uh, we had I think just one. Uh, we had Cacao give us a video as well as well as Telia based in in Europe, but um, uh, the rest have been mostly U.S. companies that we're talking about. Yeah, so this is not really happening in a lot of places, right? I think both because of government pressure and because there's not a lot of other incentives for companies to take up this sort of reporting. But we have seen TikTok, for example, which is a Chinese company that's now operating in you know Western countries, take this up, I think because of the sorts of pressure from governments, from civil society, from journalists to open up about this data. Because the nice thing about this data and, and making it as public and as transparent as possible is that you know it allows you to kind of escape a lot of a question because you can say, look, the data is all here. This is what we've seen. Um, and it's important for it to be as comprehensive as possible. Um, and you can sort of see trends over time, especially, you know, I've seen some companies take up this practice for a couple of years and then say, ah, like no one's really looking at it. Uh, and that's a huge problem because it's really, you know, a big indicator for us to see, okay, you know, five years ago, Egypt was only sending 10 requests a quarter to this tech company. And now they're sending a hundred or, you know, 200. That's a huge increase and indicates that there's something happening there between the user base of that platform and the government. Another big uh, factor that I really like to see or a big reporting metric is how often are those uh, request denied, because that tells me that there's some sort of overreach happening there, right? Like if most of the requests are accepted, then it's perhaps, you know, there's a good relationship there between law enforcement and the platform, and that's not necessarily a negative thing. But if a high percentage of those requests are getting denied, that indicates to me that that government is maybe, you know, overreaching into people's privacy. Um, and it's good to see the platform sort of standing up in that way, right? It's not a good sign if a tech company is accepting every single request they get from every government. That's a very bad sign, really. So, you know, seeing those sorts of metrics can be really helpful to understand how governments are interacting with tech platforms. Um, and also just to see sometimes when they're, they don't seem to be intervening at all, because um, that also tells me that there's maybe, you know, potential problems there. I think there's sort of a good balance where you know, law enforcement and governments do want to interact with these platforms, you know, do want to participate in safety in legitimate cases. Um, but the transparency reports are the only way to sort of see to what extent that is happening and how that relationship is evolving over time. 
Right. And you can track the rates of compliance. And, and it seems like governments are learning better how to request data and, and demand data from companies, right? Thanks. Great. So um, uh, another key stakeholder group that uh, has used these reports and really made the numbers meaningful uh, is, is, of course, academia. And uh, we're glad to welcome Elizabeth Renieris, uh, who's affiliated with Harvard's Carr Center, as well as the Berkman Klein Center, um, but is now interim uh, policy at Ranking Digital Rights, um, the uh, fantastic foundation founded by um, Rebecca McKinnon, a project of the New America Foundation. Um, and Elizabeth, uh, I'd love to hear more about um, where you see reporting going and where really Rankin Digital Rights is, is leading uh, the reporting towards um, as, uh, uh, as we pass 10 years. Thanks, Peter, and thanks to Access Now for hosting. So Rankin Digital Rights has been uh, publishing a corporate accountability index since 2015. Uh, in 2015, we ranked 16 companies on 31 indicators. And in our forthcoming 2020 index, we'll be ranking 26 companies on 58 indicators. So it gives you a sense that norms really are starting to emerge um, and consensus is starting to build on both normative and non-normative standards. Um, but it's still challenging because as you noted, Peter, this, was, uh, this trend really emerged in part uh, after the Snowden revelations. And so what we still see is a, is a residual imbalance between transparency on government demands um, and versus enforcement of companies' own internal rules and policies, uh, things like terms of service enforcement. Um, and this is also, of course, partly due, uh, as some others mentioned, to uh, things like GNI membership, which focuses on government requests. Um, but for example, in the 2015 RDR index, uh, not a single company reported on terms of service enforcement. And over time, we've seen uh, you know, more detail and improvements um, in that area um, to the point where in our forthcoming index, we've actually created an entire indicator family around things like enforcement of internal policies. So uh, for example, with terms of service enforcement, separating things like account versus content restrictions. Um, we've also asked for more details around um, advertising content and advertising targeting policies um, and internal enforcement of those. So um, the changes are there, although they're incremental. Um, but one of the biggest challenges we see and an area of focus in the future is that um, companies are still defining the nature and the parameters of transparency and transparency reporting. Um, really, we can't let industry set the terms. We do need government, civil society, academia, and researchers, um, and really importantly, um, communities who are really effective and who you know, stand to have their human rights impacted to be substantively involved in the process of developing uh, the standards and the, the indicators for these transparency reports. Um, another thing to note is that we are getting more um, sort of quantitative and substantive transparency. So the, the what, right, around uh, actions taken, um, posts removed, uh, things like that, but they're still, they still tend to be aggregated and aggregation is a huge problem. Um, when things like uh, types of content or restrictions or even types of rules enforced are aggregated, it really blurs the picture for some of these stakeholders, particularly in civil society, academia, and researchers, and really um, undermines our ability to understand and interpret the reports. Um, so there, you know, we would strongly encourage uh, looking at the Santa Clara principles uh, that really break down uh, the effective type of reporting uh, metrics there. But an important thing to note in the future is that we need to get um, more of the what, but we also need more of the why and the how. So we need more qualitative reporting. We need trans uh, process transparency. The process transparency is really important because what it does is it creates sort of um, replicable standards. It creates the basis by which we can uh, actually implement effect and design effective accountability standards. Um, and in process transparency, this is data about rationale around how rules are formulated, how policies are developed, how actions are taken and decisions are made, um, even things like the relationship between human versus automated decision-making, how moderators are trained, how training data sets are developed, from the rationale you know, for, for those methodologies. Um, and you know, as Jessica pointed out, the companies and services are really different. Um, nevertheless, the process transparency is sort of an area where there can be more alignment, um, and in some ways it's even more important because it forms the basis for these effective uh, interventions that I outlined. So in terms of the substantive transparency, you know, we are seeing better, uh, we are seeing better disclosures there. But again, even on things like very basic things like data collection and use, um, we're not seeing enough information around, for example, inferred or ambient data, which we know are really fundamental and have a really uh, profound impact on people's uh, privacy and other fundamental rights. 
Um, we need more transparency around the use of algorithms and targeted advertising, uh, which as um, uh, a co-panelist noted, will be a focus in the, in the Europe's uh, Digital Services Act as well. So that's an area where there's likely to be regulatory intervention. Um, we still lack context. A lot of uh, information disclosed is decontextualized. Um, so without recontextualizing the content, it's not gonna be reproducible and it's not gonna form the basis for the emergence of norms and standards. Um, and really, as I noted at the outset, um, these transparency reports are still largely a matter of corporate best practice and goodwill. Um, but we are at the point where we do need legally binding requirements. Um, so some of, some of the you know, promising interventions uh, or excuse me, promising developments in that regard are that we're seeing better data, for example, on appeals. So um, appeals is an area where traditionally we haven't seen much information. We often just got raw data or numbers, but we're starting to see more information around, for example, the range of enforcement decisions, um, but they can be better, right? So instead of just knowing you can appeal a granular decision, can you appeal things like downranking or algorithmic manipulation or other interventions or automated decision making? And if you can, what are the factors there? So um, there, you know, there's also obviously room for improvement of the you know, advertising policies. Um, often those things are not even in transparency reports, but they may be things like informal company blog posts. Um, so that is a sort of area for a potential process standardization as well. Um, I'll stop there, Peter, in the interest of time and happy to take specific questions. Thanks, that, that was amazing. Yeah, you hit um, algorithms without without saying artificial intelligence, I think, which uh, we all appreciate. So no, th that's fantastic, yeah. And we are getting questions about um, whether any companies are reporting on algorithmic transparency on explaining um, their algorithms, opening up that black box. Um, and we've got that as well as a couple other company focused questions. So I think I'll probably go there. But um, uh, one is around the auditing of transparency reports. I think Telia gets their report assured. Do any others? Um, is it effective? Um, we've got a request on um, Canadian authorities requesting info. I don't know if there are any secret Canadians on this panel. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I, but I, I do want to go first to to Alex, I saw you sh uh, shaking your head and nodding a lot um, at what Elizabeth was saying around process transparency, especially. And then if you could just tell us um, you know, what, what Google might have planned uh, for your reports. Well, I'm not sure I, I, if there's anything I can share about what we have planned just yet, but I do really wanna underscore the importance of everything that was just said um, around the importance of context and qualitative transparency. I think we have been really trying to think about, you know, we have all of these transparency reports that provide metrics, and that's obviously very important to have the numbers around enforcement, what we're removing, what we're responding to. But at the same time, how can people understand what our policies actually are and how we enforce them and how we develop them? And so, you know, we've begun to do that in particular ways, like we have a disinformation white paper, and that really walks through how we think about the issue, how we have created policies across each of our products, how we enforce those. Um, and so that's one way where we've been thinking about how can we help folks understand what we're doing on a particular issue and how that relates to content moderation. We've done a similar paper on information quality that's focused on how we remove, um, raise up, reward content across all of our products as well. And so that's another effort to help folks understand what we're doing with respect to removals, but also what we're doing with respect to ranking too. Um, and the other piece I just really, I think we even think that that context is important when you look at things like our legal removals, um, that's our shorthand, our, uh, um, our report on government requests for removal of content. Uh, and we do include annotations as part of that report. And so what that does is help, um, the purpose of that is to help users and anyone using the report understand why there might be spikes in the report. And so you can see that, for example, um, on Russia, where the, with the year that we implemented our compliance with the VPN law, and you would see a spike in the URLs removed across search. Um, and you see that happen in other, in other countries where you can see when a local law was implemented and how we responded to that. So it really is, I think, it continues to be about companies and governments. That is one important piece that I think we should not lose and continue to advocate for governments to be transparent so that we have a holistic understanding of engagement with each company, but then also what the government is doing. Um, but then really to help folks understand our products. 
Um, the other thing that we've done is start to develop entire sites that are focused on helping people understand the product. So we launched how search works earlier this year. We have, um, sorry, we launched how YouTube works earlier this year. We have long had how search works um, and another site called how play works. And that walks through all of the policies, um, sort of how we implement them, the way that we think about the product, because certainly how we think about it, that gets back to what we should be driving for in transparency and how it looks different across each of the pro each um, kind of type of service. So what we want from transparency on search is maybe not the same thing that we would want from transparency on YouTube, what we're trying to learn. And so when we think about comparability across types of service, understanding how the product works is a big piece of that. When it comes to um, algorithms and how they work, we are also spending a lot of time working on that and trying to figure out what is what does meaningful transparency look like? How much are we talking about explainability, just understanding what in fact we're doing and what types of transparency are meaningful to our users, to the public, to experts like the ones um, on this panel who are probably more familiar with what companies are doing, um, as well as regulators. And so how do we you know, make that information more usable to all of those audiences? Those are things that we are currently focused on um, and I think, you know, things like the EU DSA um, and other regulations and other policy conversations are helping to move the, move the discussion forward for, for the industry. Right. Yeah, uh, certainly is regulation coming around the corner. Um, and, and to that, uh, Dunstan, can you tell us about assurance and um, how you can actually are these reports trustworthy and, and who says so? Um, and then maybe also talk about ways that uh, reporting here and these rather limited reports can fill um, the much larger gap around the range of human rights that are impacted um, by tech companies. I did just want to pick up on the point about uh, assurance. So assurance uh, exists for two reasons. Uh, assurance exists to make sure that the things in the report are right but it also exists to make sure that the right things are in the report. And we often think about assurance as making sure the things in the report are right. In other words, making sure they are accurate, uh, that they are comparable over, over years, over time. Um, it's less common to think about assurance as making sure that the right things are in the report in the first place. And so that for me is an interesting angle when it comes to the lack of reporting by other tech companies or companies in other industries. So if they're doing effective full human rights due diligence that covers the full list of human rights and you ask the question are the right things in the report in other words the, the cumulative disclosures that they have i think you might identify that there's a big gap here in many companies so when we think about assurance i guess my point is don't just think about it as are the things in the report right but also think it think about it in terms of are the right things in the report in the first place peter i forget the second part of your question however yeah, I was asking, how can these reports fill uh, the general gap around reporting on non-financial matters like human rights and governance? Yeah, I think one of the really interesting trends over the past decade, of which the transparency reporting trend has played a full part, has been increased disclosure by companies on very specific issues of interest to very specific target audiences. And one of the things that I would like to see from companies going forward our reporting strategies that on the one hand meet the needs of investors or other analysts who might want the strategic overview of the company you know in on one page what are the big issues we're addressing and how we are addressing them and then on the other hand provide the really detailed uh, complex information that specific audiences want and achieve both in combination and i think often we have this conversation about well does anybody really read transparency reports in my experience, they do. And there are very specific, very important audiences who then use that insight to inform their interactions with, with others. So I, I think I would answer your question by saying we'd love to see strategic approaches to disclosure by companies, of which this very detailed information around law enforcement relationships and other elements of transparency reporting would be an important part. Thanks, Dunstan. Um, I want to throw to Uber. Uber innovated by 
uh, showing requests from airport authorities, right? Which is a, a key stakeholder for them and, and their clients. Um, uh, there's a specific question about uh, for Utara, can we get data on country specific government and legal requests from Uber? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say visit our transparency report um, site. You can access it from the, the main Uber page. Um, currently our transparency report is limited to the US and Canada, but we're actively looking to expand our report. Um, and I think that, you know, the complexity with that is just that, you know, regulatory reporting is in, is enormously complex. And, and you'll see that when you take a look at the report, um, trying to identify, you know, other regulators, transport regulators, um, land use regulators um, globally has been a challenge. Um, but again, to the points that every panelist has made, it's an investment worth making. And we're, we're looking forward to taking that next step. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else want to jump in? We've just got about one or two minutes left. Um, love to hear any closing thoughts. Um, burning, what's really in, the, in your nerdy heart of uh, desire? Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I just want to thank everyone for, for joining. Um, I think uh, everyone is is all in this in terms of trying to d decide and understand what people need to know about how their companies work and how you process data uh, and how uh, we can make reporting more meaningful. Uh, and uh, I want to thank all of the panelists for joining. Um, I will be handing off next uh, to our illustrious RightsCon director and not secret Canadian, um, and uh, she will uh, take us away. Um, thanks, Nikki Gladstone. Great, thanks so much for that very kind introduction, Peter. Um, thank you to all of our speakers for joining us and to everyone for tuning into this uh, first event in our 10th anniversary series for RightsCon. We're really looking forward to over the course of the next few months in the lead up to our 2021 event, celebrating a, a decade of convening for human rights in the digital age and our next event will take place on June 7th to 11th, 2021, 2021 fully online. Uh, right now, our call for proposals is currently open until January 19th, and it's a great opportunity to continue conversations like this on transparency reports and a lot of the other really critical program areas that will be explored in the RightsCon program. So you can learn more about that at rightscon.org, and we uh, really hope to see you there. I will throw it back to Isedua to close out the panel for today. Yeah, thank you, Nikki, and thank you to Peter. Thank you to um, Nicole and Michael and um, our whole host of uh, panelists who spoke today. I think the conversation we had was really insightful um, and it's helped to give us a clear idea of where transparency reporting needs to go moving forward. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to keep this conversation going after the event. We'll follow up um, with a link to watch this video for those who couldn't watch live um, and find other ways to con continue to engage this community in how we can improve transparency reporting going forward. So yeah, just thanks again for taking some time out of a Friday in December to join the panel about transparency reporting. Um, we really appreciate it and wish you a very good day. Thank you. <laughs>